Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. A couple of brief announcements before we get started. First, if you would like to be part of the recording crew, uh, we could use a few more volunteers for this coming Friday. Uh, we are we need to keep it to 10 or less, but a couple of our recording volunteers, uh, one has a funeral to go to and, and other things. So we're going to uh, get some, let, let Gary McCafferty know if you're available for that. So we have uh, some voices to bounce off of me, so you're not just listening to me. That's really a nice thing. Um, also, uh, your council will be meeting on the 19th. We're hoping that uh, the state will have gone to phase two by then, but after they meet on the 19th, that those decisions will be promulgated to the congregation. One of the decisions that will be made is whether or not we meet. We have a congregational meeting slated for the end of the month. This will begin, we're going to start a little bit early, but you have here a verbal announcement of that reality. And if we, if we go to phase two, then we will have that meeting. And if we don't go to phase two, we will not have that meeting. It will be postponed and you will be informed once it happens. We have some basic business items that need to be dealt with for our quarterly meeting. I think that's about it for announcements. So I invite you uh, to rise as we sing our opening hymn. Please rise. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And He forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and just and deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, 
of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. comes from Acts chapter 6, selected verses. Now, 
In these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists among uh, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned a full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom he, we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Then, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of freedmen, as it was called, and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrian, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised of heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as for your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not prosecute? And they killed those who announced the beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by the angels and did not keep it. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory and the Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed to get together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of the young man named Saul, and they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Put not your trust in princes, in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. over the sojourners he upholds the widow of the fatherless but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin our epistle text for today comes from first peter second chapter verses two through ten like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. 
as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For as it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, and they are destined to do so. But you are chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had no, not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If you were not, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will t take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. For now on, you do know him and, and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is, it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe in me that I am the Father, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our hymn of the day. Thank you. 
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Within our society, within the way we do things, we have tests to figure things out. Maybe you, know, maybe you remember tests you were prepped for when you were in high school or in college, and you were told, if you are interviewed for a job, and you are asked to dinner for as part of that interview, make sure you taste your meal before you sprinkle any salt or pepper on it. The implication being that if you're just a person of habit and you put salt and pepper on things without thinking, you're not one who takes the time to think things through and decide if the meal needs salt or pepper before you put salt and pepper on it. There are also tests for royalty. Uh, I believe it's Hans Christian Andersen who gives us a test for royalty in the famous fable of the princess and the pea. We've all heard it before. Uh, Poor prince can't find himself a bride. Mom and dad are lamenting. Young prince is lamenting. And lo and behold, that evening, a poor princess, caught in the rain, comes knocking at the door to say, My land is at war, and I lost my guards, and, I got, and I'm cold, and will you let me in? And so they take her in. And, of course, the young prince sees the beautiful young maiden and says to mom, Hey, I think maybe if she's a princess, I could marry her. Well, mom says, okay, I'll figure out if she's a princess or not, just because she claims to be a princess, and you know, maybe people know we're looking for a princess here. Uh, so she puts a pea on the bed, and then she puts seven mattresses on top of it in order to test if she's really of royal blood. Of course, she greets her in the morning, and mom's, uh, mom is affirmed, the queen is affirmed, and saying, yep, she's definitely a princess because... She didn't sleep, she was thankful, but she didn't sleep very well on that seven layers of mattresses that were making her uncomfortable because of one little pea underneath. The Apostle Peter is talking to the diaspora in our text today. That would be those who are spread all over Asia Minor. They were a minority. They were being prosecuted for the faith. Peter encourages them to persevere following 
Christ as they are called to do in whatever circumstance. And he reminds them that they are chosen race, a royal, we may have noticed the connection, royal priesthood with my introduction there, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. How is it that we who are certainly not of royal blood would deserve such a possession? test would certainly point out that, I don't know about you, but I fail when it comes to being royal. Uh, we would sleep like babies in a seven-layer bed covered with blankets, whether there was a pea under the seventh layer or not. We would not fit the bill for royalty on this particular test. And how many of us would do poorly even in tests of etiquette at not, not just a meal where you're being interviewed, but these days, having manners and following those manners, those, that scene is kind of out of touch. And, and you really can't need to be more with the times and just go with the flow. Once you were not a people, says Peter. Now, when he says once you were not a people, this text is describing unrepentant people who reject Christ. Those whose lives are ruled completely, if you're not in Christ, your life is ruled by sin. Without Christ, we're lost. And we are not part of God's royal family because our natural, sinful state can only focus on one individual and no one else can share the podium. It focuses all of our thoughts and our efforts on me. And the problem is and we think only about ourselves, then we will naturally isolate ourselves. Social distancing is actually something that the old Adam within us likes. I really would prefer it if people stayed away from me and I could do what I want, whenever I want, and not be bothered by people being around me. Because nobody is worth taking a chance on, worth taking a risk on. Because we see everyone else probably having the same selfish motives that we do. We project our own selfishness onto others. So no one can be trusted. It's a vicious spiral that we can get in when sin is our slave master. It cuts us off from others and it cuts us off from God because we cannot believe that anyone would have an honest, selfless motive toward us. Even being worried about what others think, about what we do, is not about others. It's about us. I don't want to look good or I don't want to look bad in the eyes of others based on some decision I made or didn't make appropriately or inappropriately. How I look. It's all about me, me, me. Without Christ, we can only deal with the, the realm of our own sinful nature. Battling the things mentioned in the verse that precedes our reading today, we didn't read that, so I'll read it for you. The very first verse of 1 Peter 2 says, Malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Those are the things that natural sinful man struggles with. Those are the things that motivate a sinful, unclean heart. An identity centered on self is really no identity at all. But that is all being a slave to sin has to offer us. If we look back at our princess, even though she shows up soaking wet, she passes as royalty because of her royal blood. One does not choose to be royal. That's something that you have or don't have. We don't get to choose what family we are a part of. So royalty, or faith, which connects us to God through the cross, makes us royal in God's sight. When this text talks about us being a royal priesthood, that's the kind of royalty he puts upon us. Once you had not received mercy, says the text. Without Christ, there is no mercy in the world. Because if our motivation is all self-centered. Those in need don't receive any mercy. They go unserved. Prisoners don't get visited. Shut-ins 
don't get and won't get visited. Can you imagine the loneliness of lying in an institution where the only people that you see on a regular basis is people who have paid to feed and clean you? Loneliness, hunger, six. These people will not be helped if selfishness is the only thing that drives what we do. The list goes on. If our selfish, sinful nature is the motivator, the world becomes a place full of needs that get unfulfilled. We show mercy to our neighbor, not because we have to, not because it earns for us brownie points. No, we show mercy and love to our neighbor because that is what naturally flows from a life of faith that is redeemed and made royal by proclamation. And we do it because our neighbor needs it. Without Christ, we are prisoners to sin. Not royal, not holy. And prisoners don't stay in the castle. Pri I mean, royal prisoners are in the dungeon. That's where they belong. They get locked up in the dungeon. And their taskmaster, sin, is a terrible taskmaster. Prisoners are not appointed to positions within the kingdom. They certainly are not granted royal positions. And prisoners stay in the dungeon. While the chosen king and the appointed have positions of honor and prestige within the kingdom. You were called out of darkness, Peter says in the text. We could not find our way, the old proverb goes, out of a paper, wet paper bag if we had to on our own, right? We, we can't find our way out of sin's dungeon, but we can be brought out by the one who redeemed us. As a matter of fact, we sometimes must admit we are comfortable in the darkness because the darkness covers up things we don't want people to see. We might like the darkness because of what it hides. The world doesn't even know, for the most part, the world is ignorant of the fact that it exists in darkness. Calling evil good and good evil, this can only happen when one lives in darkness. When we speak of the truth and we speak it in love, we will be branded as narrow-minded, old-fashioned, or even an old-fashioned phrase that talks about being old-fashioned, an old fuddy-duddy. I imagine a number of people below the age of, say, 20 or 30 wouldn't even know what that is. Fuddy-duddy. Not Elmer Fudd. I'm not talking about him. An old fuddy-duddy. You've got to get with the time. times, And you need to stop being a bigot because we've moved on. And those things that used to be bad, they're not bad anymore. But God doesn't change and neither does his word. Be ready to suffer for speaking the truth. Sinful man rejected the capstone. With all their biblical knowledge, the, the Sanhedrin were blind to who Stephen was in our gospel text to who those are who call to save us. Sinful man stoned Stephen to death. And sinful man held the cloaks as the stones were being thrown. Sinful man asked to see the Father when the Son was right in front of him. Sinful man hung Christ on a tree, and we are their accomplices. But Christ, but because of Christ, you get up. You, you get up after a terrible night on an uncomfortable bed because you were of royal blood. Blood. You felt the pee. No, more importantly, because you were of royal blood, you are never comfortable with sin against God or man. It never sits right with you because there's a new creation within you that is not okay with sin because your miraculous faith is never fully comfortable with things that sin against God and man. And the, that miraculous faith which connects you to Christ is what makes you royal in God's eyes. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, says Peter. Peter is talking again to the diaspora, as I said, those spread all over Asia Minor. They were scattered and persecuted. They were a minority, usually not a minority that was well treated. So they knew what it was to feel persecuted for the faith, to be lonely, to be rejected. They wondered 
how God could choose them. Just as we wonder, how can God choose us when we are unworthy of his mercy? But they were not just chosen. They were choice, chosen to a royal priesthood, a priestly position. Just as we are chosen to a royal priestly position. That doesn't mean that everybody's a pastor. It means that everybody is called to live and share their faith in whatever vocation they have. It means we're called to be royal representatives to the royal household, to carry his message of love to whatever and wherever we find ourselves. We are all part of his house of living stones. Not stones that kill and destroy like those that were thrown at Stephen. No, we are a house of living stones that gather in God's saints, a place of word and sacrament and nurturing of the faith, service and selfless love for God and his neighbor. A holy nation, a people belonging to God. Now, a holy nation, that really sounds good to isolated people who are being persecuted and treated as second-class citizens, probably, in the places that they are. But this is a nation in which there are only citizens. You have a high office in a nation, and it's not just any nation. It's God's nation. Where you are chosen and usually, in the world, when someone is chosen, they're chosen because of skill or something that resides within them. But that's not why you are chosen to be a member of this nation, no. You are chosen because of what Christ bled and died for and gave to you, proclaiming you his own. What sets this holy nation apart from all other nations? A holy nation is a place for holy people. Members only, in essence. And the only way to be a part of his chosen people is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now you are a people of God, says the text, saved from ourselves by the redemption, the redemptive act of Christ. Sin is no longer our master. We may have been in the dungeon, but we're not there anymore. We are royal princesses as the bride of Christ and he is the prince of this kingdom and he laid down his life for his bride. In gratitude we joyously seek to serve him who saved us in and through all the things that we've been called to do. We do these things to show our love for others by doing things, by visiting prisoners and shut-ins, by loving and caring for the lonely, by feeding the hungry, the ones that are falling between the cracks, the ones that get missed, caring for the sick, because that is what the royal bride of Christ is called to do. Again, Peter tells us that you may declare the, pra the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The story has a happy ending. They lived happily ever after. Excited, like that new bride, to declare what her bridegroom has done for her. The idea of God's will and accomplishing it excites the bride. Where we are privileged to be his bride, spending time in him in word and prayer and his sacraments and in fellowship with Christ's other brides, members of that bride. In Christ's royal and living stones, he shines through those who love and serve others. For him, in Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. away from thy presence and take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen.
outbreak of the whole church and all people according to their needs. Almighty Father, everlasting God, your Son has revealed you to us as a merciful Lord. Give to us your Holy Spirit that we may believe in him whom you have sent and do the greater works he has told us we will do in his name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have promised to build up your church to be a holy priesthood, and your people might offer the spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving acceptable to you. Bless your church and bring all congregations back together again. Bless all pastors who proclaim Christ to us. Bless all church workers and those prepared, preparing for full-time church vocations that your church may be supplied with faithful leaders and servants of your word. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy God, your power brought all things to, into being, and still you preserve what you have made. Bless our president, the Congress of these United States, the governor, and all elected and appointed civil servants, so that they may honor you and your purpose establishing order and justice, encouraging virtue and protecting all life. Give wisdom and moderation to them in their leadership for the well-being of the nation. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, merciful Father, you have compassion on the sick and those in need and have promised not to ignore them in their afflictions. Turn back the pandemic across the globe and give us relief. Bless the sick with healing, those who suffer with strength and patience and dying with peace. Hear us on behalf of Laverne Sharp, Judy Schuler, Tom Melanowski, Jim Wagner, Dick Medley, Gloria Hewling, Donna Kinder, all who grieve and, and all who presently suffer grief, illness, or anxiety associated with the current pandemic and those who we name now before you in silence. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray for those who celebrate another year of life, Jerry Frank and Phyllis Asaph, and the anniversaries of Merle and Nancy Donaldson, Mike and Jenny Paul, and Corbin and Stephanie Oliver. Lord, in your mercy, gracious God, you have established the home and bless those who show us your love. Bless all mothers and children in their care. Bless all families and make their homes a place of blessing and love where your word is spoken. Forgiveness reigns and love is displayed. Give us good examples to inspire youth in all the good and pure and seek after these things. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have given us the wisdom of faith that through the Spirit we might know your Son to be the, the way, the truth, and the life. Bless all those who teach and all those who learn and the goal of our knowledge may be to know Christ and to make him known. Do not let your word go found, be found and let it be free course among us. Preserve those who in isolation from idleness or illness and instead let us let our minds be renewed in scripture and prayer. Lord in your mercy. Compassionate Father you are not aloof from the needs of the body and life. You have called us to love our neighbor in need and give aid to the poor. Give us courage and faith that we may not fear sharing the resources you have supplied us with for those who will live in want, especially the widow and the orphan and the unemployed. Let love be perfected among us and drive out selfish fears. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you, O God, for your goodness in hearing our prayers, your people, and granting us confidence to approach your throne of mercy. Hear us now in the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we trust in your promises and boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Close with him 584. Faith and truth and love the snow. serve the Lord. Thank you.